another edition of Inside the Circle with yours truly, Andy Fusco. Today we have world-renowned bagpiper Robert Watt, all the way from Northern Ireland. And we're going to have an intimate conversation. Intimate. How are you today, Robert? I'm, I'm pretty cool and fine today. Okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. Bit jet lag, but all that. <laughs> yeah. You just flew in last night? Just got in last and night. And your arms are tired? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a lot, of, a lot of my eyes, you know? <laughs> yeah. So we just wanted to discuss sort of your history a little bit as your bagpiping history. If you would uh, start with when you started the pipes, how old were you, and who did you learn from? Um, I started in the local, my local pipe band was a band called Tam and um, I was seven years old. Um, apparently, I was always interested in playing bagpipes or interested in, in pipe bands, and when a band would go past at home in the local town, um, I was always like interested from when I was really small. So my dad took me along to the local band and that's where it started. Uh, yeah, went to band practice two times every week and, uh, and went on from there. And you started practice channel when you were seven? Yeah, still got the same practice channel. The one that you played today? Yeah. Really? Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, was there a specific moment in your life when you realized that pipes were for you? Was there a, one of those? I guess, that, yeah, I suppose there was, but I, I mean, it was really just a hobby and I was into all sorts of other things um, as well as just, it wasn't just all about piping. But then um, I started getting interested in uh, a few solo competitions and stuff like this and um, yeah, it moved on then to the main focus was on and sort of the main interest went into piping and uh, about what age would you say you were when you really flipped for you? Probably um, not till I was 17 or 18, maybe even 19. Uh, have you ever regretted getting into pipes? Not at all, no. I mean, it's it's like, it's one of those things you start and if someone said to me like 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you'd be doing pipes as a full-time, sort of pretty much full-time job. Um, you wouldn't really believe it, but probably the best thing I've ever did because, um, yeah, the, all of the traveling, all of the things that I've done over the last few years has been through playing music. Well, that's a great point. You, you play all over the world. Can you give us some examples of where you've been thanks to piping? Yeah, well, most places actually. Not uh, still a lot, to, still a lot of places to go, but um, I mean, I've been around a lot of the US, um, Australia, New Zealand, all over Europe um, and it's pretty much all been because of, of playing bagpipes. What would you say is your fondest uh, moment in piping? Um, some of the competitions obviously that uh, you play in and have won as in solos and with the band. It's okay to brag here if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's, it's a lot of a lot of great memories of um, all things that's that's happened through just playing the pipes. A lot of funny things, a lot of crazy things, and okay. yeah. Do you have an embarrassing story related to piping that you'd like to share with us? Oh, plenty of them, but I can't. <laughs> <clears throat> um, who is your best teacher, and why? For solo piping, that's uh, Norman Dodds, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I met up with Norman and he started me on a new line of, of practice and, and really quite back to basics on many things um, after having played for like so many years already. And you're already in field marshal at this point. Yeah, that was just at the time I, 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 found, I started going to Norman for lessons and I also um, started to play in, in FM. So that was, okay. that was all around the same time this was happening. So it, it was a lot of work at that time because I the big change, all the tunes to learn for grade one. Um, the band did a concert that year, so it was a lot of repertoire. And also I was getting really into playing in, in the solos. So I had all my tunes for the that time I was playing in the silver medal. So you bring up an interesting point, I'd like to explore it a little bit. Norman Dodds becomes your teacher and he takes you back to the basics. And at this point you're already well established and doing very well for yourself. What? How does your ego handle that? How do you, what do you... The thing was that until then I had played um, in, at the, the, 
the top end of grade two, when the band, Tamla Rukuli type band, had made its way, we had made our way to the top end of grade two from I joined as a kid. But I was playing really only the band tunes in the band style and not really, uh, didn't know much at all about solo piping. And when I, when I first went to Norman, um, I still remember he, he, he got me to play a 68 march and he stopped me after the first part and, and, and took me back to the first bar. And we started with a whole string of different exercises, really about really improving technique and, and trying just to get everything perfected and, and not, not miss that grace note and stuff. Was Norman, would you consider him a, a hard ass as a teacher? He doesn't, it's either, it's either right or wrong, there is no in between. Okay. And that's really, to, to be at, to play at, at, at a very high level or to do anything well, it has to be like that. There is, it's either, it's either right or it's wrong. And that's, he wouldn't accept anything else. Would you say the best teachers tend to have that quality? I think it's it's horses for courses, isn't it? I mean, it depends what you want and how far you want to go yourself as an individual, mm -hmm. how much discipline that you are prepared to give and 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 take. So it's it's really. But if if you want if you want to do something really well, then I mean, all the best sport players and everything they they have to have that discipline, don't they? Who are your favorite musicians? now in piping and or otherwise? Well, in piping, I was very lucky to spend a lot of time with Gordon Duncan. Um, in fact, Gordon took me to my first ever Highland Games <laughs> in South Uist. And uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't got my driving license all that long, so driving was also like a novelty. I had a lot of time with Gordon and, um, and learned an awful lot from him. Uh, when I started then getting into the game circuit, um, I went to quite a few Highland Games with Gordon Walker, uh, who is also uh, one of the one of the greatest entertainer, great player, great bagpipe, great guy. Um, so I I kind of had a really uh, but a completely different style to to Gordon Duncan. So in the in the early days of competing around the games. Um, I had I had really influenced from 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 both sort of sides of that, so I got really into the folk scene a little bit, mm -hmm. and also into the serious competitive scene, and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. What would you say? You're you're an established teacher. You teach in Germany, in the U.S., and all over, I suspect. Um, what would you say your biggest pet peeve when teaching? Or even judging competitions or listening to a piper play, what what do you grab right away? What what do you stick with? The bagpipe is everything. So if you don't have the instrument, it doesn't matter what else is going. Um, so the sound is the sound is has to be first. It has to be musical playing, and then when you have the whole package with the technique and the, and the flair to go with it, then that's that's really getting a, getting a good sound. Okay. So given that, <clears throat> what is the most indispensable item in your pipe bag, besides your pipes, of course? Oh. <laughs> There's nothing else in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, actually. I've seen your case. It's yeah. basically empty. It's a bag. The practice chunker. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, here's a great question for especially new people competing. How do you handle mistakes during a performance or a competition? Don't make them. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to just try and keep, just try and keep going, and, and uh, yeah. And if you make a mistake, um, I mean, forget it. Come back the next day. It's okay. it's it's done. It's over. Um, I remember one time at the Northern Meeting, um, I came off. After playing in the, I think it was the, I think it was the A grade march or something, um, and uh, I walked down and I met Alistair Gillis, and uh, he said to me, "How did you go? How did you go?" I said, ah, "It was good," but, and he stopped me, 
He says, but, he says, forget it, come back the next day. <laughs> it's only if there's no but. Right. So, and it, it, I thought about it and it's very true. Yeah. If you can come off the, after your performance and, and know that, know that you have done everything to the best of your ability and, and, and it's, it's spot on, then it's over to the judge. What advice would you give someone masochistic enough to want to make piping or drumming a long life career or pursuit? Yeah, it's it's not easy. Um, it's very difficult to do it solely, to live solely by piping. I mean, it is possible, but there's not many people that are doing that. Um, and even some of the guys who are like, uh, pretty much just doing piping, they're actually doing other things on the side, so you've, you've got your teaching, you've got your maybe products for sale and stuff like this, so it's, it's, not, it's not easy to, uh, you, you, need, you, need a lot of, you need a lot of things going for you and you don't need to be too worried about um, where you're getting the next money from because it's, you know, it's not, it's, most of it is, is really a hobby, and most of it is for fun. Now, you referenced um, learning tra uh, traditional music or competitive style with Gordon Walker, and then more of the folk music with Gordon Duncan, correct? Um, we debate here just for fun very often about the pros and cons of you know, playing bagpipes in a folky way versus a traditional way or competitive way, if you will. Um, what are your thoughts on well, one, folk music with bagpipes um, versus uh, traditional classical style, and also the playing of modern music on the bagpipes. I don't care what it's what it is as long as it's played well. Okay. And if it's played if it's played correctly and played well and tasteful and musical, I can listen to absolutely any instrument and any kind of music as long as it's done well. The, the kitchen piping and all the all the flashy stuff that you play in the pub um, that's that's all very well but the piper should have all the basic ground and discipline of correct correct technique so that that other stuff is a sideshow really but uh, if you take for example great players like um, well currently Fred Morrison Fred is a really good example. Played in so many folk bands, has done all of the folk stuff, but don't forget, his technique is impeccable. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to what he learned in the very basics. Um, so I do believe you've got to be able to do that mm -hmm. before you can start to do the other thing. And, and, and all too often, I hear too many players, especially young guys today, playing all the really flashy finger stuff, but they can't play a March to Spain reel or a good 68 March. Right. And that's that's quite sad. And, and it's, yeah, there's a time and a place for everything, but um, but I, I, I want to hear the real stuff as well as the, as, right. as the other stuff. <clears throat> what do you think it takes to make a great piper? What distinguishes truly great pi uh, players from everybody else? Great player for me is someone who has an amazing sound, their unique sound, um, has the great technique, um, but most of all is musical. And that is, the, that is the most important thing for me. How would your life be different if you weren't a piper? God knows. <laughs> I might have more money. <laughs> um, like I said, everything I have done over the years, um, how your life changes, what you, what you're, what you're doing in the future, the doors that have opened and, and closed uh, through playing the bagpipes, it's, but it's 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 life and it goes on hopefully for a long time. Would you play another instrument if you weren't a piper? Is there another instrument you're interested in? I play a little bit on the whistles, um, play the small pipes, of course. Got mortar pipes, a dabble at the own pipes. Actually, I'd love to play piano, yeah. um, and it's something my mom wanted me to do when I was a kid, and I was into too many other things. 
and didn't do it, but actually I would like to learn piano, and yeah. it's just if I can find the time. I, I tell you, pipes are great when it comes to picking up the ladies, but piano, there's nothing like a piano player. Yeah. Women just swoop. <laughs> yeah, well, the only thing with the piano is not as easy to carry. That's true, good point. <laughs> now you write tunes as well for the bagpipes? Yeah, I've written a few tunes yeah. over the years, and I, yeah. You've written a tune called Jim Thompson of Flagstaff, in honor yeah. of a friend of yours. That's right. Um, and that tune has made its way slowly, but it's made its way around the world. Bands kind of all over the place have made it, uh, started playing it, as well as, if I remember correctly, the Edinburgh Tattoo, they played it there. Um, how does that make you feel as a writer, just to know that your one of your tunes is, everybody likes it, it's, all, it's starting to show up all over the place? It's nice. I mean, um, that tune came around very, very quickly in the end. It's something that Jim, of course, started the piping school in Arizona, in Flagstaff, and uh, I got uh, invited out in one of the first years, right at the beginning, I think about the third year I was there, and Jim was, well, you know him as well, he, he was a real character and a real great <laughs> guy, and only loved what we do, playing pipes and taught some really good players and give so much of, of what he loved, playing bagpipes to, to, the, to everyone around the area and, and further afield. And I always said I want to write a tune for Jim and didn't do it for about three years in a row and then hadn't even planned to do it and was on the flight from LA up to Flagstaff, that's only about what, an hour or something, and halfway into the flight, uh, I just thought, I need to do this tune, and I just wrote something down, and that was it. Um, so it's like, yeah, sometimes you write nothing for months at a time, and then suddenly you have two or three in, 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 in an hour. Right. It's okay. just funny how it goes. Yeah. Okay, last question. This is a good one. Feel free to say whatever you want. <laughs> but what is your favorite curse word? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he doesn't want to answer that, but that's okay. I've heard a lot of curse words out of Robert's mouth. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> as a student of his, I've heard many, unfortunately. I'm slowly learning German since I've spent so, <laughs> spent so much time in, in, uh, in Austria. So I suppose you could, Scheiße is maybe as good as we can say on, on edited. Right? <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate you taking the time to interview with us. Thank you. Um, we are live, well, we're not live, this is recorded. I don't know what I was thinking. At Hennessy's Tavern down on Fremont Street in Las Vegas. Uh, again, inside the circle with the Las Vegas Pipe Band. Robert will be playing tonight, and we're looking forward to that. It's going to be amazing, I'm sure. Hopefully the jet lag is off another few minutes and we make it. But uh, anyway, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. <laughs>